Today, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Robert Gang uh, telling us about uh, cutting and pasting for managers. Let's welcome Robert. So, uh, I'm a topologist, but not so used to talking about such a physics oriented crowd. So normally, what I want to talk about today is spend a few weeks on the graduate formula for this course. So I, my, my intent here is to just kind of demonstrate some of the tools, try to give you a flavor for what goes on. And, uh, anyone is sufficiently inspired to dig deeper into it, that kind of work. Stiptions at Graduate Studies in Math, 99. If you just uh, Google God for Stiptions, you'll find that they're not the most common names on the planet. All right, so let me start uh, with what I assume is common knowledge for this crowd, and then we'll more study. Everyone draws for a discussion of Morse theory is a torus turned on the side like this, and you look at the height function <coughs> projection on the vertical axis. So, if we want to understand the topology of the torus by Morse theory, what we do is put our inner tube in the bathtub and uh, we turn on the water, and the water starts rising up. And if we have a sort of fish eye view of this, at first we don't see anything, but then we pass this index zero critical point, and after that, what we see is a disk under the point. And we we'll let the water run in a little further, and then we pass this index one critical point, and after the index one critical point, then what we see is this, this uh, endless cylinder of light. And then there's yet another critical point, and after that, we see a puncture torus, and then finally, we get to this index two critical point, this maximum, and then we see the entire torus. So that's how this works in general, that uh, every single function can be perturbed to be a Morse function, meaning it has these non-degenerate critical points, and, and they're supposed to tell us about the topology of math. Uh, so what I want to do is translate this into an equivalent language of uh, handle by this period. Which, well, Describe this same picture in the world of handle bodies. We have a zero handle that's our original disk, and then as we uh, as the water rises over the saddle point, it changes the topology into into uh, an annulus, and we can pick that in the picture by adding handles, so we get this sort of basket shaped thing, which of course is different more when the corn is off, it's diffeomorphic to the animals up here. And then we get this other index, one critical point, and if, you, if you're doing more very carefully, you might notice that the, uh, the descending manifolds that follow the gradient flow lines from this index, one critical point, we end up in this index, one critical point. But if we do a small perturbation, then in fact, these flow lines will drop all the way down to the zero handle. And so now we can draw a tubular inverted orange curve. This. So now we've added a second one handle. 
and I think it's not so easy to see what the boundary is, but we go around here and around here. Uh, we just trace all the way around this thing, uh, and we, we see that the boundary is a single circle, so we can attach it to this, which is two of them. So these things are for one handles, and then we attach like two of them. So, so handle body theory is pretty much equivalent to Morse theory, only we're just thinking of cutting a base thing instead of, instead of uh, looking at some function. And another way of thinking about this is usually when we think of a torus by cutting a base thing, we imagine opposite pairs of edges of a square being moved together. Well, instead of gluing the entire end, what we can do is add a one handle here, and that actually has the effect of gluing this little piece of the edge to that little piece of the edge up to, to be more because it's the same thing. And similarly, we can glue the top to the bottom, and once again, what we see is that if we say start here, trace around, jump over the handle, come back, go around here, jump over this one handle, here, jump in the other direction of this one handle, and um, come back to where we started again. That's a single circle. So, this picture is exactly the same as this one, but it kind of flattened it out a little bit. So, what is the general theory? Well, it's an n dimensional. K cross dn minus k. And I want to think of this as being a k-dimensional disk and sort of thickened up in enough extra directions to make it n dimensional. So I think of this as being glued to the boundary of some other manifold, boundary of some n manifold x along boundary dk cross the dn minus k. And uh, so again, well, inside of here we have uh, what's called core dk cross zero. And so we should think of this as being just kind of thickening of this core in here, which is being attached along the boundary of this cross zero. And uh, so at the level of homotopy theory, if we make something of a sort of handle body is something that's made out of handles that would be did with this torus. And so if you're only interested in the homotopy theory, uh, this thickening doesn't do, any, do anything. And really, we're talking about a cell complex. So if you want to compute the fundamental group of the homology or something, then you're just doing CW complex theory. But if you want to really understand this smooth four manifold, then the normal directions become important as well. So we want to actually think of these as being thickened up thickened up cells rather than just cells of the nose. So uh, okay, we need to attach these to things. And so then the question is, what information do you need to specify the attaching? And so we specify, uh, well, first of all, the attaching sphere, which is found in example, if I start out with a zero handle and I want to attach a one handle, well, the boundary of the one disk is the zero sphere, which is two points. And so I can attach my one handle like this. Here the attaching in these dimensions. I've got zero sphere across from the one disk, and that's my whole attaching region. But now, uh, so first of all, we want to specify where the fluid map on the attaching sphere. And uh, then we notice that's not quite enough information because it can take the same zero handle and exactly the same attaching zero sphere. And I could 
includes that, you get a Mobius band. So you get the level of homotopy theory, these are both circles, a zero angle, a zero cell, and one cell. Uh, but somehow what's going on in the normal directions is affecting the topology of this And so we need to specify the attaching sphere and a normal frame. Normal. Take it as a big trivial i over this interval, and then if we trivialize it, well, we have arrows pointing in the normal directions all the way around. Here, the arrows are going <coughs> downward or kind of the equivalent of going upward. Here, if I start the downward arrow, we end up in an upward arrow. So we see two different normal framings on this zero sphere. So that's what the picture looks like in low dimensions. And um, one dimension higher, just, just as a comparison, uh, how one well, with a three dimensional number of ideas is how far we've got. A zero handle now is a three dimensional ball center. And then we attach a three-dimensional one handle. So now I've got a zero sphere crossed with a two-dimensional disk. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be going to uh, assume everything inside is oriented. That means there's really only one way I can attach a one handle and zero handle. So now let's attach a two handle. Well, for this to make it interesting, we'll assume the two handle goes twice around the one handle. And then to get back where I started, I have to run around the back and here. So this circle, let's think of that as maybe attaching circle with a two handle where I can't draw very well. Uh, and framing is not going to be an issue here because again we have a uh, one dimensional normal handle and uh, that's uniquely trivializable, so, so there's no framing issue. So now I'm going to add my two handle. And well, once I add a two handle, uh, before I add the two handle, the boundary is obviously a torus. After I add the two handle, get a check by the Euler characteristic, for example, we're down in the sphere, which means I can attach a three handle into that two sphere. And that gives me some closed three handle. Is it? It happens to be three space. And in fact, inside of here we can see uh, inside of R P three we can see R P two. So there's a subset. Namely, we just move this band and I'm drawn inside of here. We have a Mobius band whose boundary is this attaching circle. Well, then the two handle has a core two disc, and we put that together with the Mobius band, and that's a projected plane. The whole thing without the three handle, the whole thing is just sort of a tubular neighborhood that projected plane is going to be attached to three centimeters. Yeah? So, so far, the specific choice of attaching that, uh, have you said anything about whether it can affect the diffeomorphism type? Of uh, yeah, OK, in high dimensions, for example, if I have Two seven dimension. If I have seven dimensional zero handle and seven handle, and I glue them together, well, your exotic diffeomorphisms of the six sphere, and you can use that to get exotic spheres. But if we're in dimensions lower than that, then there's no issue with that. Here, uh, mainly I'll be talking about dimensions four and below, and uh, so the, the, the uh, highest sphere that comes in is a three sphere, and this is a unique. Orientation preserving self to geomorphism in the three sphere of isotopes. That is like if I reverse orientation, well, that extends over the, over the animals, it doesn't change it. So you said this, this problem kicks in in dimension seven? Or yeah. yeah. The numbers exotic seven spheres show up in, in, in higher dimensions, you have troubles. But in lower dimensions, this isn't an issue. In particular, dimensions fall in the world. We just draw the image and that's something. Uh, 
registration doesn't happen in 5.6? Um, I, I, I it's not going to happen in it's five, six, right? I mean, that's probably really careful here. So, so that's the story of dimensions three and below. Uh, so dimension three. Those of you who know about Hager and splittings might recognize this as the Hager decomposition of RP3 effect. Handle theory and Hager theory and dimension three are pretty much the same thing. High dimensions, uh, and things get more, more complicated. Uh, but in fact, there's a history there too. Around 1960, Snell proved the H cobordism theorem using Handle theory. And the idea there was that an H cobordism is something that up to homotopy looks like the product interval. Uh, on a Morse theory, for example, we can think of that as uh, like an honest manifold across an interval with a bunch of handles attached. And then what Snail did was to kind of slide these things over each other and around and cancel handles. And eventually what he did was cancel out all the extra handles of the ball that he was left was in cross I. So that proves that any H coordinates is in fact if you want a product with an interval. In particular, the top and the bottom boundaries are the same. And so in high dimensions, if you want to, you want to show that two manifolds are the same, well, you just use surgery theory to see that they're related by H cohorts and you're done. So high dimensions, there's a lot of powerful machinery uh, for turning topological questions into algebraic questions. And that really comes from the H cohorts and theory from this other surgery theory, which Works really well. The H Kaborzin theorem, for example, works as long as the boundaries have at least five dimensions. That's enough room to do all this sliding along this kind of thing. Uh, so, in high dimensions, there's a very, yeah, manifold topology has a very algebraic sort of flavor to it. But in dimension four, for smooth four manifolds, all that stuff breaks down. Uh, so, we can still do handle body theory with uh, its uh, more technically different. In high dimensions, it always works both in the topological category and also smooth category. Yes. And in dimension four, uh, the H Kaborzin theorem and the S Kaborzin theorem, according to Friedman, work in the topological category as long as the fundamental group doesn't grow too fast in substance. So for simple genetic manifolds, for example, the field of the fundamental group. And uh, in the topological world, all that high dimensional stuff works pretty well. But in the smooth category, according to Donaldson, everything breaks down as badly as it possibly can. So let's move on to the dimension. Uh, really interesting. We moved to dimension four. So let's uh, let's look at uh, well, take a simple example. Let's look at the discipline. schematically in half as many dimensions. Well, I guess <clears throat> I already did drew schematic pictures of integral bundles in the circle. So we can just double all the dimensions here and see what's going on. And the idea is, well, let's think of one of these things as being Notice that the spheres, the union of two disks, will be together. 
And over each disk, the bundle has to be trivial because the disk is intractable. So we've got two copies of D2 cross D2 moving along the boundaries. I'm going to think of this first one as being a zero handle, and then the second one will be a two disk glued along the boundary of the disk cross the disk, so that's a two handle. And so now I just have to specify the frame detaching circle of this two handle. And a good way to see that is that. Well, inside of here we have disk cross zero. So that's, that's uh, the interior of this manifold. But what we can do is find sort of parallel copy of this. We take disk cross the boundary. And what we see is it's just an isotope. You take this circle on the boundary zero handle and move it over to here. And then it actually bounds a disk inside of the boundary three sphere. So for my uh, picture, well, here we have a picture of a disk inside the three sphere, and I guess I'll specify anything else here. Where is the zero handle? This is just four ball. The boundary of this is three sphere, which is R3 union point infinity. And I'm going to identify this R3 with the black. So now what I'm going to do is draw the attaching spheres of all the handles inside of R3 and remember that I'm going to think of it as the boundary of zero handle. So here in the blackboard, this item essential look in the boundary of the zero handle. Inside of here, I, I see two disks in this three three sphere. And what I want to do is push the interior of that disk into the four ball. So we have to kind of imagine this is sitting on the boundary of the four ball whose interior we can't actually see. And then we just sort of push that disk down into the interior, leaving the boundary where it is. And so this yellow curve is the attaching circle of two handle. And now the only question left is what's going on in the normal directions. Remember, that can be an issue in itself. And here it's a slightly more complicated issue. What we can do, let's look at where, uh, so this, this circle is supposed to be uh, boundary of the disk cross zero. Let's draw the boundary of the disk cross some point in the boundary of the other disk. So I'm gluing along uh, something that's exhibited as S1 cross D2. So, so we've got S1 cross zero and S1 cross another point. And we want to compare those, and that'll tell us how much interesting it is. Well, we can assume these are the same going most of the way around, but when we, when we uh, glue these things together, there might be some amount of twisting. And in fact, the amount of twisting, well, we can twist by any integer. Uh, with negative integers corresponding to the left twisting, the positive corresponding to the right twisting. And uh, really, what's measuring this twisting, if you want to show it carefully, is pi 1 s2. You know, we have the normal R2 bundle, and we have, uh, if I'm comparing two trivializations, I get a whole circle of those trivializations to compare. Them. So that's a really important Or as over here in the picture, I literally drew the I0 of O of 1, which is two points. So that's why there are two. Things I can make by attaching a two dimensional one thing over the zero handle and then a whole integer worth of things I can make by attaching a two handle to a zero handle. Notice, by the way, if I were doing this one higher dimension, dimension five, I'd be able to find minus three, which is Z2, and so only the uh, parity of the twisting would matter in that case. I want all the rest of 
SO2 is just a circle, basically, so it's fundamental to a disease. You can't yeah. how many times you burn in a circle. Yeah. Like you can match in some Oh, for a pi 1 of SO3, yeah. I can demonstrate that. This is not. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> this is fuller. <laughs> but uh, see if you uh, think about uh, right in between my hand and my shoulder, there's an inter interval worth of two spheres. Uh, and so the, the, the isometry group of two spheres is SO3. So if I rotate, I'm not sure I can do it. This, well, if I rotate a full 360 degrees, I'm all twisted up. But if I keep rotating another 360 degrees in the same direction, I get for a start. So that's that's why why uh, pi one of SO three is interesting too. Oh, sorry, I'm confused. Why pi one of SO three? Oh, if I were one dimension higher, I would. Oh, oh, okay. Three SO three. Yeah, also I have the question. So, so you roll and work D two on over S two. Where is that? That's in this picture. Ah, that's another good picture point. We can actually see the two sphere in this picture. Remember, we had a two disc and we pushed its interior into a zero. Well, there's another two disc, which whose boundary, if you like, is, well, you can think of it as being this orange thing. Uh, it's the core of the two handle. You take the core of the two handle and put it together with this yellow disc in the interior of the core ball. Now we get two spheres. So you can actually see, just like in this case, you can actually see the core surface. All right, let's get a little more complicated here. All right, next I want to look at the products of spheres. So we can look at uh, S1 process 3, or we can look at S2 process 2. Um, or for, should try to schematically, then the torus, of course, is S1 process 1. And, well, here is one of the product circles, and, and uh, here's the other product circle. So we take an S1 cross point to the point cross S1, and that was how we got our chemical decomposition of the torus. So we can play the same game with these other products. And here we have a zero handle, one handle, three handle, four handle, zero handle, zero, two, two. And the handles in the middle generate a circle of three spheres, two spheres. Right, well, over here, uh, we start with the zero handle whose boundary is the blackboard again. We have a one handle. And well, one handle gets attached to a zero sphere, so that's a pair of balls. Only now, instead of being one or two dimensional balls, we have three dimensional balls in the blackboard. And so we have this picture. You just have to imagine this handle is kind of stuck out into the fourth dimension that you can't see. Or another way to think about it is we could just take these two balls and imagine them being glued together by their narrow dimension reflection. That's really pretty much the same as saying we'll take these two edges and put them together over here. So there's our zero and one handle, and then we have a three handle and four handle. Well, you can actually see where the three handle is if I wanted to draw that in. The problem with the three handle would be a sphere like this, and then uh, the circle is this arc glued to itself going over the one handle. And the three sphere is gotten by uh, taking this orange three ball and pushing its interior into the zero handle and then capping it off at the core of the three. And the intersecting one point is you would expect the composition. Well, in general, it's really hard to draw two spheres in these complicated diagrams. Fortunately, we don't have to. You can kind of see why here, namely, uh, if we look at just the yellow stuff, the boundary of this stuff is going to be S1 cross S2. It's the boundary of S1 cross D3, which is what we had when we just added up this one. And uh, well, the other piece I want to 
have is I'm going to talk about what we can interject this. We can turn the handle button upside down. From the Morse theory point of view, it's really easy to describe that. We've got the Morse function f, and we just replace that with minus f, and that turns the whole picture upside down. So each index k critical point becomes an index n minus k critical point. You're just flipping the signs over the group. In the, the language of handle theory, what's happening is that the k handle is dk cross dn minus k attached along uh, well, the boundary of this across to this disk. Well, if we instead reverse the roles of the two disks, well, now I've got dn minus k cross dk, so that's an n minus k handle, and I think of it as being attached along the boundary of this across to that. So instead of building from the bottom up, I'm building from the top down. Well, if we look at it this way, well, the three and the four handle together become a zero and a one handle. And a zero and a one handle together are just S1 plus T3. The boundary we've already seen is S1 plus S2. And so what's happening here is that If I have any closed manifold, it's got a handle decomposition with a bunch of three and four handles. Well, if I look at those three and four handles upside down, it's just a bunch of zero and one handles. So the worst thing, maybe I connected some of these S1 plus S2s to the boundary. Well, it turns out is a theorem by Lagenbach and Pornaru that says that uh, every self diffeomorphism of that boundary, the connected sum of S1 plus S2s in general, will extend over this manifold here. So what that says is that while there may be a lot of ways of attaching these handles, they all give the same manifold, because if we change our mind about how we attach, well, that just corresponds to reparametrizing the union of three and four. So uh, in general, we just write down how many three and four handles we've got, and that completely determines the formula. So that's the picture of S1 plus S3. We have a one handle, and then we remember that there's also a three and a four handle that we need to close the thing off. Uh, what about S2 plus S2? Well, if I just take a zero handle and a two handle by itself, that should be a sphere across a disk. And I'm going to say careful and uh, push the number of twists we get in this picture equals the oil number. So when n equals zero, that's a sphere across a sphere across a disk. And that would make way to do some exercise to actually draw two disjoint spheres inside that parallel to each other numerical. So if I just look at the zero handle and the two handle, that's my picture. Well, if I look at the zero handle and the other two handle, I see the same picture. And I claim that the entire picture looks like this. So uh, one can prove this carefully. I broke it up really carefully with the underbrush. But uh, let's just come up with some motivated piece here. Now we're inside the zero handle and we're attaching a picture kind of like this. We're attaching two handle here and two handle there in the sphere. Uh, well, the attaching regions of these two unknotted spheres that intersect, that, that, that link each other once. What I want to convince you of is that, in fact, they found disks in the four ball that intersect at one point, and that says that S2 cross point and point cross S2 are intersecting at a single point, conversely, they should. So the way to see that is we just Think of depth in the zero handle as being a time coordinate. And then we have sort of a movie of this. We've got, we've got uh, our hop flank to start with. And as we move deeper into the four ball, these circles will start to shrink. And at some point, they'll pull through each other. And that point where they pull through each other is the crossing. And then we have the unlink. And those things separately shrink to points. And so we have a picture exactly. 
So, so you can actually see by just descending into the core ball, we have two spheres in this picture with the intersections. So, to see this, I want to remember this picture of the torus drew earlier on, the zero handle, the two one handle, and the two handle. That's the torus by itself. If I want to draw the torus across the disk, I basically need to take this picture and thicken it up into more dimensions. So the zero handle will become the four dimensional zero handle as boundaries of the blackboard. And uh, I don't want to just draw the, the four-dimensional handle, but I want to think of the two-dimensional zero handle is sitting inside it. And we already know how to do that. Namely, we take our uh, we take our uh, an unknown circle, think of it as spanning a disk if we push down into the interior of the four ball. That is our zero our two-dimensional zero handle inside of the four-dimensional zero. Here. And the next thing we want to do is add these two one handles. Well, the one handles, the two dimensional one handles, well, there's a two dimensional one handle attached joining these two arcs together. Well, for the four dimensional one handle, what I'm going to do is draw the one handle here again, reflect it to the mirror to see how these glue together. And so now we have a four dimensional one handle. Inside of it, we have this two-dimensional one handle, and so the two-dimensional thing inside is an angulus or cylinder inside the cylinder across a disk. And now we do exactly the same thing above and below. So we've got a second two-handle, which just lets we should have in this other picture. And then uh, so we've got a zero handle and two one handles, and then the real question is how do we attach the two handle? Well, the two handle should be attached along this red boundary curve that we drew before. Where is that in this picture? Well, we start here, we hit this one handle and we jump over it, and we come out here, moving along here, we jump over this one handle and we come out here, we go here, jump over the one handle and come out here, and we come down here, jump over this one handle, and then we're back where we started. So in fact, these four red segments all fit together into a single circle. Uh, in fact, so it's the same circle we drew over in that picture. And so then, if I want to, if I want to uh, then make a disc bundle of the torus, what I do is attach a two-handle along this red curve that's running right over the one. So what I need to do is specify the framing of the integer, which I can do this way. Uh, in general, it's a little tricky to see how an integer defines the framing. Uh, what does it mean in this case? Well, it's fairly simple in this case because we actually have an explicitly drawn puncture torus. We can actually think of it as being the boundary of this formula if you like, because a, a disk and then the two one handles. That's a puncture torus whose boundary is, is this red curve. And so the zero framing is supposed to be the framing that we get by, by pushing, say, into that, into the torus. So for any null homologous circle in the four manifold, it's going to be canonically framed in that way. It turns out to be independent of the choice of surface that we have. Then if I want to get the discipline of any normal oil number n when we put in n right-handed twists in the positive case or absolute value of the left-handed twists in the negative case. So, so this uh, so that 
that's our torus plus a disc, or more generally, the disc under the torus. Um, but now I want to change the notation. So, so uh, let's look now. There's a uh, different notation that we use for one hip that's also very useful. And to understand that, let's look one dimension lower down. Here we have three manifolds, and suppose I've attached a three dimensional one hand to it. Like that. How else can I draw this? Well, so what is the effect of this one hip? Well, imagine you're in, you know, a highway engineer or something. You've got one highway going this way and another highway going the other way. You don't want them to intersect. Well, what you can do is build, build a bridge so that the green highway goes over the purple highway. Well, there's another way of solving that problem. Instead of building the bridge, we could just, and suppose we already built this, this green highway and now we want to construct the purple highway. What we can do is put in a tunnel. And when we construct the purple highway, now we go down through the tunnel and again we avoid the intersection. And in fact, Hopefully you can see that these two pictures are diffeomorphic to each other. If we just sort, of, we just sort of take our finger, hook it under here, and pop it up, then that creates the bridge. So these two things are essentially the same. So three dimensions, adding a one hand is the same as drilling out a little undotted one hand on the side. So to go up to dimension four, I still want to add a one handle. But we have one more dimension, so what that means is that instead of drilling out a neighborhood of an arc, we should drill out a neighborhood of a two disk. So what that looks like is here's our two disk. I'm going to drill out a neighborhood of a down four ball, and the notation we use is to put a dot in the circle and then we can just drill out that neighborhood. Scooped up that neighborhood. Ice cream scoop going through there or something. And so now uh, I claim that that is the same as if one temple. So we have this is in front of that one. So in our in one picture, the green highway goes over the bridge like that. In our other picture, the green highway just is left alone. Well, now in of course, in three dimensions, two arcs are generically not going to intersect each other, but instead of having a purple road, we have a purple sheet whose intersection would be green and the white sheet portion here. Where is that sheet in this picture? Well, it looks like this, only it's been diverted so that now it runs along the boundary of this, this scooped out neighborhood of disk. So this picture and that picture are just the same. Another way to think of that is if what we notice is that the boundary three manifold here is or well, claim that the boundary three manifolds in both of these cases are S1 cross S2. Over here we have this picture I've drawn as S1 cross three ball. So when we add a one handle to a zero handle, we get S1 across the disk. Uh, so then the boundary of that is S1 across S2 in this, these dimensions. And uh, on the other hand, if I draw this picture, well, that's S2 cross D2 as we've already seen. And so the boundary is again, so it's S2 cross S1. And so we can get between this picture and this picture by surgery. Let's 
classically a high dimensional topology called the surgery. And what that is in general is that um, if I have well, if I have a sphere across a disc of any dimensions inside of my manifold, well I can drill out a tubular neighborhood of it. The boundary will be a sphere across a sphere, but then I can fill in that sphere across a sphere by turning the other sphere into a disc. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I've changed the two-disc into a circle. Now I want to change, think of the two-sphere two as being the boundary of three disc. And so I just, so the point is, well, really I should write that D2 cross S2 here. And then the boundary of this is S1 cross S2. The boundary of this is S1 cross S2. So, and so the way I want to think of this then is that here we've got an S2 cross D2 whose boundary is this S2 cross S1. If I erase the zero and put a dot on as in this picture, I have the same boundary as before, but I've changed the form and all of a sudden now it's this one. So let's see what that looks like in this picture here. So what I want to do to change the other notation is we'll grab these two balls and we'll twist them around and push them really close to each other. So now the picture looks like the two balls that we had before were still identified by reflection. They just sort of done this watching what's happening in the mirror so everything still fits together. And now we're going to change notation, and the way we do that is we just erase these two balls and then I'm going to do the same thing with these guys. So I'm going to bring them around. There. So that's a different picture of a torus cross a disc. And what we notice is that this picture looks very much like the one we're drawing over there. In fact, we can explicitly see the puncture torus inside of this picture. And then we get a whole torus again by sticking on a uh, sticking on the two-handle and using the core of the two-handle to cap off the puncture torus. exercise to just take this diagram and push it around the blackboard and try to simplify this complicated looking red curve. And it turns out that what we get is there are two dotted circles and there's a zero frame and two. So in fact, this picture up to isotopy in S3 is the same exact picture. So we get the world in the rings. Uh, again, you can see the, the torus inside of here. This two-handle attaching curve bonds the disk, so we would have a sphere if it weren't for these dotted circles. We'll, we've removed those dotted circles, so now we have punctures in the disk connect those punctures up by a tube, and we actually have a torus sitting inside of there, and that's torus at this point. In fact, this is, this is T2 cross D2, and the boundary is the three torus, which is S1 cross S1 cross S1, one of my favorite Kirby diagrams. It's a, it's a very beautiful picture of the three torus. You can think of it purely three-dimensionally by just imagining the we do a little classical surgery like I was just talking about. We drill out all three of the solid tori and we glue them back in with meridian longitude reversed. And uh, so we explicitly see the torus in there. Another thing we see is there's a, there are 
a lot of symmetries in this three torus. For example, we can cyclically permute the three coordinates. What does that look like over here? Well, we just rotate 120 degrees, uh, adding a, or changing a zero to a dot doesn't affect the boundary, so at the level of the boundary three minute form, this is 120 degree rotation. And that's the signal permutation. It's in fact, where are those S1 cross points? Well, here's one of the circles, here's one of the circles, there's one of the circles, cyclically permuted. So then, in fact, another exercise, you can actually take this torus and use that to see the other two product tori just by rotating them. And you can see directly that any two of those intersect in a circle that's isotopic to one of these circles, and all three of them intersect in a point, so everything goes just like we would expect it to. What this picture looks like. Imagine that uh, uh, we started out with a zero interval, which was more disk. And uh, yeah. See, these two dotted, if we erase the top circle, these two dotted circles are unknown in length, so they found disjoint disks. And so inside of the four ball, there are these disjoint disks that scooping out that. And then we add a two handle on the top, which schematically I can draw like this. And uh, so that's the picture. And you can see again that uh, as far as the three manifold is concerned, it doesn't matter whether the handles are up or down, we're getting the same picture. And that's what that was symmetry. But now we can play some uh, slightly fancier games here. Because I can think of the force here as being two four disks put together. And right, clearly, since this is since this is an unknotted disk, I can think of it as being pushed into the upper hemisphere of the force field. And so now I have this whole picture sitting inside of the force field. Four ball, and we scooped out these two discs, and we filled in that neighborhood. Yeah, so this picture schematically represents the T2 cross D2 sitting in this form. In fact, this is the uh, simplest possible embedding in torus and torus here. Of course, you have lots of not in torus. But uh, this one's the simplest possible when this is just basically S1 cross S1 inside of R2 cross R2. Infinity, which is S4. So this is the field of Clifford torus. So the standard example of the torus on this board. So let me ask a subtle question now. Let's let E denote S4 minus the interior of this torus cross a disk. Now what is the complement of this, of this torus cross a disk look like? Well, schematically we know right where that is. That's the sort of black part of this picture that I had filled in. We've got four disks we remove. Remove one two dimensional disk and then we add in two two dimensional disks, and we're doing it all in the same link. There is actually a general procedure for looking at the complement of one thing and another thing in Kirby documents, but I'm sort of bypassing that because we have such an easy picture. So, what does that look like then? Well, again, we take the broken rings and Rings and now what I want to do is where I 
added a two handle before, I want to scoop out a two handle from, from the four ball. So I have a dot there, and where we scooped out before, add in. So this is what the complement of the torus crust is. That's one picture. Uh, there's another picture that is informative in a different way. Maybe I can sort of grab this sphere and pull it out, and grab, grab this circle and pull it out, and grab the one behind and push it back. And then we'll have a picture that looks something like this. But now you can see some other structure, namely each one of these zero frame curves by itself is unknotted, so it represents a sphere inside of this manifold. So we have two spheres. How do they intersect? Well, in each of these clasps, when we push down into the four ball, we're going to see an intersection. So schematically, what we've got is a pair of two spheres intersecting transversely in a pair of points at opposite sign. Signs are shown in clasps here, which are in opposite directions. And so now what we do is we just thicken that up to get a pair of spheres across the disk, and that's what this is going So in fact, what we have, what we see is that, well, we've got some non-trivial fact here that we just derived, namely, you can decompose the four sphere into two pieces, one of which is a thickened up torus, and the other of which has gotten by taking two spheres, intersecting them in this way, and then thickening them, and then uh, just fit those together along the top of the boundary. Yet one more observation I want to make, namely, how does this picture compare with that picture just as manifolds and boundary handlebars? Well, what we see is some of the main difference. In both cases, we've got the Borromean rings, which have this 120 degree symmetry. The main difference is that over here we have two dotted circles, and over here we just have one dotted circle. So what that tells us is that this complement E and T2 cross T2 are gotten from each other by a single surgeon. So if we take either of these two spheres that we've just drawn, we're moving that sphere across the disk, so that's basically taking one of these zeros and changing it to a dot. Uh, so we, we, remove, we remove the sphere across the disk and we glue in this one across the D3. That's uh, changing the zero into the dot. Then what happens is we change the zero to the dot, so we just rotate the picture 120 degrees and see that picture. So surgering out one of these two spheres and replacing it with a circle gives us a torus across the disk again. Going the other way, we take the torus across the disk, take circle cross or a product circle cross a point inside of there and surgery it out and glue in a two sphere, well then you get the company E. So that's uh, an observation that will be useful to us in a few minutes. How oh, is surgery classified? Is there a way to classify possible surgeries? Um, well, no, because in general you could have a lot of spheres inside of your manifold or a lot of circles inside of your manifold. In this case, and if you just look carefully at the two pictures, you see which sphere you have to surgery to get. So what I'm saying is that uh, there's a particular surgery in the two sphere that you can do the E to get this, or a surgery in a particular circle over here that you which ones let me just look at the picture the picture test. Well, sorry, well, are there possible 
minimum amount of surgery as generators that we can use for generating that will possible um, source matter for expansion in lower dimensions. Well, yeah, that's uh, sort of related to a, a deep question of four manifold theory that if you have two four manifolds with uh, the same simply connected four manifolds closed with the same intersection form, then in fact they become diffeomorphic after you've connected some of the S2 plus S2s. That's some of what you actually can do using each chordism type technology in the region before it goes back to the law in circa 1960. But uh, uh, then the question is, what's the smallest number of S2 cross S2s you need? There are no known examples where you need more than one S2 cross S2, so it's conceivable that you can always do it with just a single connected several S2 cross S2s, which is the same as surgery in a circle. If you have a simple connected four manifold, then, then uh, really it only contains one circle up to isotope, because there's no way to tie a knob in a circle with four dimensions. So it's, the reasonable conjecture that maybe you only need one S2 cross S2 to get from one to another, but at this point we have no, no way to put any sort of bound on it prove that. So then if there's one, say, along those lines, at least that's sort of given. Another thing that's known is that you can get between any two oriented close four manifolds by a sequence of surgeries on circles and spheres in general, if and only if they have the same signature. So that's something that's not, there's no bound on how many surgeries you might need. Let's, uh, now that we have these pictures, let's start looking at what we can do by cutting and pasting them off. I think we're getting a little closer to things that might be more relevant to topological field theories, although I don't claim to understand the physics at all. I think doing the cutting and pasting is crazy. So, uh, let's see what we, can, what we can get out of this. What happens? Well, we've seen that. S4 is E union of identity map T2 plus D2. That's, that's the definition of E that we created by force. Uh, what happens if we take E union T2 plus D2 with the glued instead by a cyclic permutation of three circle factors? So that's this under 20 degree mutation. Well, we can actually see how to do that in these pictures now. Because uh, well, okay, what does what does this look like? What do we have? We have a bromine rings. Let me try E now. So I have zero and I have up to Two zeros and a dot. That's, that's the same thing we're doing there. And the first thing we need to see is how to fill in the T2 cross D2 by the identity to get back to force. And that is not hard to see. What we want to do is glue it in. First of all, what are we gluing in? Well, the torus cross disc by itself is a zero handle, a two one handles, and a two handle. But we want to think of it as glued in upside down along the boundary. So it's a two handle, two three handles, and a four handle. Just by flipping everything upside down. So I claim the two handle goes there, and then we have two three handles, four handle. Why does the two handle go there? Well, we can see in this picture, remember the E was the white stuff, or the black stuff in this picture, not the, not the shade of yellow stuff. Um, so 
So what we did uh, to create that one head was we scooped out the disk and looking at both of them upside down. We want to fill that disk back in again. So we're gluing in the neighborhood of this sort of co-core disk. So we're attaching to this frame circle here. Well, if I just take that zero frame circle and slide it down to the bottom, it will be visible as a zero frame. So really what's going on is when I add that two handle, it fills in the hole here, so I no longer have that dotted circle. That's what's called a one-two cancellation. And then I'm left with an unknotted, unlinked pair of zero-framed two handles. And those will cancel the two three handles. Remember, it doesn't matter any way that I attach the three handles and four handles will give me the same manifold, so I might as well attach them in a way that cancels out both of those two handles. And then all I have left is the zero handle and the four handle, which is force. So that's how to draw uh, this. And incidentally, I've given you one of the, one of the curvy things, canceling a pair of handles and adjacent index. So I'm going to put a one, two pair and a two, three. So now what, I, now what we need to do to what we need to do to uh, solve this problem is we need to, so this blue stuff, remember, is T2 cross D2 attached onto the boundary E. What I, we want to do now is to change the gluing map so that we're gluing with a cyclic permutation. So we want to take all this blue stuff and glue it on after twisting. And so now the picture looks like. And what's going to happen is now the blue two handle comes out there, and we have two, three handles, four handles. And so this is our answer. You just need to simplify that and figure out what it actually is. And for that, I have one more, one more, uh, the other. Or curvy curvy move that we need to see is uh, uh, well, let, me, let me describe it in more detail. Suppose I have <coughs> suppose I have <coughs> an intersecting. Uh, suppose I have <coughs> two uh, strands of some curvy diagram like this. And suppose one of them suppose one of them is a zero frame gradient to this red strip. Well, the fact that I have a framing zero here means that if I take this pushed off parallel copy that's untwisted, that actually bounds a disk in a red form. I look at the four manifold made with the red stuff, then we're attaching a two handle in such a way that uh, the boundary curve uh, D2 cross boundary point on the two handle as this is its boundary. So in that red three manifold, this yellow circle actually bounds a disk that goes over the two handle. Well, now what I want to do is take the finger and sort of push it in like this. And I'm going to push this right over that two handle, right over, over that embedded disk that you can't actually see, and it comes out here. So that's what's called handle solving. What I'm doing schematically in, in uh, lower, lower dimensions is we take this and sort of slide so that afterwards the picture you see. Red handle is slide over. Yellow handle is now going over. Okay. So I've just kind of taken the one, pushed it over the top of it. Now, well, what is the effect? Well, OK, there's, there's two things to observe here. First of all, what I've described in the special case works in a lot more generality. 
given any pair of two handles, uh, you can just take one and push off a parallel copy of it using whatever framing you're giving. So it becomes a disk in a tree handful. And then you just band some of your other curve into that, and you get a different one. So that's what kind of slide looks like in general. But I also want to specialize this particular case I've got here. Remember the yellow curve went under the red curve. After we do this handle slide, where does it go? Well, it starts to go under and then pulls back out again. So in fact, what I've done is change crosses, the yellow curve in front of it. And that happens whenever the curve that I want to change crossings with has a zero frame on the which we have in this picture. And so I'm going to apply that right here. I'm going to take this blue curve and put it here, slide, push the one curve in front of the other one, come over here and do the same thing. When we do that, this curve is entirely in front of everything else in the picture. So we can just move that off to the side. But let's uh, draw the diagram explicitly. Uh, so I'm going to move that zero off to the side. When we do that, well, these other two curves aren't linked with each other. We have a linking on all three of these. So these two things are linked with each other. So what I'm going to have is a zero frame pop link. That's these two guys. And I will have a dotted circle. And I still have my two three handles and a four handle. I'm going to put a three handle here and a three handle here. Well, once again, the two handle and the three handle can't switch each other out. And now, well, this thing by itself, we've already identified as S1 cross S3. If I instead had the four handle over here, this would be S2 cross S2. So, really, what I've done is I've removed both of the four handles. Boundary sum these together and put a single four handle back where I have two four handles. Well, that really is just a connected sum operation. Remove a disk from each one of these things, a four ball for each one of these things, including the common bond. So we've solved our problem then when we glue with the cyclic permutation, we get S1 cross S2 connected sum with S1 cross S3. Maybe we're getting things where sort of cutting and pasting it into the DQFT type stuff. Oh. Um. Oh, so while we're at it, uh, Let's look at related. Well, by the way, what I said is actually more, more general than that. We can use any gluing with the property that it takes this blue curve and sends it to either one of the regions. It doesn't really matter what happens in the other directions of the regions. So, for example, we can do a transposition of the two circles and send this guy over here, for example, and we get the same answer. Uh, what happens? If we then look at what happens if I take two copies of E and glue them together? So there is E. Uh, well, now I have a zero handle, a one handle, and two two handles. So upside down, I should have two two handles, one three, and four. Well, then I'm going to have two two handles. Well, it's not hard to see that in fact two handles we have to go there. And so once again, what's going to happen by glue by the identity, what's going to happen is all these things are going to fall apart, and I'm going to have two copies of S2 cross S2 and one copy of S3 cross S2. Or I can just as easily glue by the cyclic permutation. What happened there is this will cancel out, and uh, 
on a one S2 process to then that's the whole answer because everything goes to the So I'll leave it so it's an exercise to see what happens in those other cases. Yeah, the point is now that we have this technology, there are a lot of games we can play with cutting and pasting in various ways, which I think to have some relevance to topological field theory. Um, but let me, uh, let me focus on one fancier example just to see how we can, to, can do something a little more complicated. I suppose that suppose that I take E and glue it to torus cross disk. But now instead of taking the cyclic permutation, I'm going to take, um, I'm going to glue by any diffeomorphism we got. So what diffeomorphisms have we got? Remember the P torus is on a three modulo integer lattice. And so we can look at all the linear transformations of R3 that fix that integer lattice. And that's GL3Z. So I can take any A and GL3Z. And in fact, it turns out that any, uh, well, all the diffeomorphisms of the boundary 3 torus up to isotopy are captured by GL3Z. So in fact, what happens if I do some more complicated gluing? I take my uh, E and my torus cross disk and I glue them away to the tor, but now instead of just doing something simple like sending this meridian to another meridian and do something more like complicated. Well, now maybe it seems hopeless because see, the first column of this matrix A could be any relatively prime triple of integers. And what that's measuring for us is how many times this blue curve is being sent around each of the three circles here. So you could have something really complicated now, and it looks kind of hopeless for trying to draw diagrams for all this sort of thing. But, in fact, it's not as hard as it seems. The first observation is that um, we can compose with diffeomorphisms of E and T2 plus D2 So, for example, the diffeomorphism of the two torus by similar reasoning is GL2 to Z. And so what I've got here basically is GL2 to Z sitting inside of GL3 Z with the property that if I, if I uh, compose, on the, compose A on the right with any element of GL2 to Z, what's going to happen is I'll just be sort of reparametrizing the torus cross disk and it won't change the format. So I can simplify the matrix A by right multiplying by things like that. Uh, another thing we could do is, okay, this is a trivial disk bundle over the torus, and then the automorphism of that disk bundle. So we can right multiply by a lot of things. Uh, similarly, E has a lot of symmetry, so there are a lot of matrices we can multiply on the left, which turns out to be the most relevant thing in this particular example. If we multiply by those, uh, we'll change in matrix A, but we won't change in form. So we can simplify basically by certain row and column operations, put it in simple form. Okay. The column operations turn out to be what's really crucial here. So, uh, so that allows us to simplify A. In particular, we can make the first column a bit simpler. Well, it's, it's not simplified enough to put it in this form. I mean, we might still be running over two of these guys in a bunch of times or something like that. So it still seems like a difficult problem. But now I want to use a trick. Remember that E and torus cross disk are related by a surgery. So what I want to do is surger one of these loops, so E, well, let's call this mental X. So if we take X and surgery, 
then what we're getting is something that looks like we're going to surge in at zero to the dot here, and now we have this picture, and now we know it's torus cross disk. Well, of course, this isn't exactly the manifold we want. We have to remember that to get back the manifold we want, we need to reverse the surgery we just did, so it's a circle of surgery. Like a Fourier transformation or something, you can reverse it at the end and see what we've got. So, all right. Well, now, remember we've simplified our A so it has a special form that I write down carefully. But it turns out that this simplified A has the property that uh, the uh, Attaching circle of the two handles uh, projects to, uh, well, let's say, projects one to one to the torus. Remember, this is a torus cross disk. Uh, every curve, but the boundary is a three torus. In general, these the curves in the three torus can project in really complicated ways to the two torus. But after this simplification we already made, it turns out we can project onto a red circle. And that's really useful because up to diffeomorphism, there's only one essential embedded circle in the torus. Right? Given any embedded circle in the torus, we can find a diffeomorphism of the torus that'll throw it onto this one goes point. And uh, similarly, we, if, if we have Problems in the uh, normal circle bundle, but we can undo those by, by, uh, by uh, an automorphism in the circle bundle. So we've enormously simplified things now. Uh, now that we've projected, uh, now that we see that it projects one to one to the circle, we can actually assume that we've got back this circle here. That's the only one there is up to the diffeomorphism. And so our final answer then is, uh, oh, wait a second, we've got an extra dot here, so we can actually wipe up carefully. We've got this and uh, two, three handles and four handles. That's what we get from the surgery. So now this handle pair cancels, and uh, one of the three handles cancels this, so we're just left with zero, one, three, and four handles. So we've got x surgery that has one cross x3. So we have a very simple answer for what that surgery manifold is. And uh oh, we have a problem because we have to do a surgery on some circle and we've lost track of where the circle is. We just did some weird diffeomorphism and we don't know what it is. But that doesn't matter a whole lot because in the end, we have to surge around some circle inside of S1 cross S3. But circles in four manifolds are completely determined by their homotopy class. You can't knock them or link them in the four manifolds. So that circle is completely determined. Once we know its homotopy class, well, of course, pi 1, S1 cross S3, is pi 1, S1, which is integers. So there's just a single integer that's telling us how many times we wrap around the circle. And that's all we need to know. And in fact, uh, so the surgery curve, the surgery circle, is determined by uh, the number of times n that we wrap around the circle, which is, which is given by the fact that pi 1 of the thing we're interested in is measured by n. When we do the surgery, we kill off n times the general. So in fact, if we know the fundamental group of the manifold we're trying to get, then we know what the surgery circle is. And we can read off the fundamental group just by going back to the original matrix. It happens to be a for the three of the matrix, that's what we're going so, so in fact, we can recover the surgery circle just by looking at the matrix. And uh, there's one other thing we need to know. There's the uh, framing. 
And remember, this is a circle in the three manifold, so it's framing really is an element of C2. And uh, well, that framing is determined by whether or not the manifold exhibits a spin structure, which again is something you can read out of the matrix. If you like. And so when all the dust settles and we look at our final answer, first of all, we see that there's a very simple family of manifolds, but all the manifolds made from S1 cross S3 by surgery, those are completely classified just by the order of the fundamental group and by whether or not they're spin. And secondly, no matter what this matrix is, X has to be one of those manifolds, and we can tell which one it is just by reading it on the matrix. So the upper left entry is N, and uh, I think it's spin if and only if the two entries belong to that are both on uh, and something like that. So, uh, so you can read off the matrix what the answer is. So there's a problem that may actually be fairly well with the TQFT stuff. It sounds hard in the beginning, but if you're clever about how you put things together, you can actually get a good answer. Maybe the one other thing I should point out is if you play the same game, gluing two copies of E together by N to P one is you trace through how this argument works, the only real difference is that we end up with two surgeries instead of one. You can still get a classification. There's no way to just to read off things, geometric things, like whether it's, whether it's uh, complex or whether it's symplectic or anything like that. It would be a nice thing to be able to do, but those are very subtle problems that don't seem very closely related to so If you start with something that you know is a complex surface or a symplectic manifold that you can generate by it, going to the condition is fine. But how about spin structures? Uh, spin structures, yeah, you can read that off the diagram. Okay. Well, in fact, I talked about it. And, yeah, it comes down to, for example, if all the if all the framing coefficients are even, then that spin. What is the main challenge in constructing four D factors for every topic? In constructing, sorry, but four D factors. Oh, four D factors. Well, uh, well, I I won't. Uh, I, I should leave to Judah to, to talk about how this relates to TQFTs. But, so the idea is TQFTs are supposed to um, you're supposed to be able to to cut and paste these things and see what happens. And so knowing that if you work as a you get support and didn't want to add something that makes sense to the physicists or is it I'll I'll speak later in the lunch seminar. <laughs> I heard that people try starting with uh, invariance of link and then try to construct for, for the invariance, but somehow this doesn't work out. Do you have any insight? Or um, how to try this well, I, I know, for example, Donaldson theory or cyborg written theory is sort of trying to be a TQFT and it doesn't quite work because when there's one positive eigenvalue of the intersection you know, form, then you've got this chamber structure that kind of screws things up. He would also cut it into a piece where p plus is zero, and that's going to be a problem. So, so somehow small b plus is causing problems. So, yeah, certainly there are things you can say about how these invariants change when you cut and paste. There's this Fleur theory of, of you know, boundaries. You, you can say stuff along that line. It's like it's trying to be a TQFT and doesn't quite know how to. I don't know, maybe if somebody was really clever. Something like those, and they're a bit skeptical about that. You've got to be able to come up with something similar. Any more comments, questions? No, like saying so. Uh, Robert, yeah.